Good morning and welcome to the 20th meeting of the committee in 2019. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they're turned to silence. I have the pleasure of welcoming two new committee members this morning. Can I welcome both Mike Rumbles and Donald Cameron to the committee? We're glad to have you. And I'd also like to put on record my thanks to Jamie Green, MSP, for his valuable uh, contribution to the committee. Before moving to our first agenda item, I'd like to uh, ask Mike and Donald if they've got any relevant interests that they wish to declare. No, nothing to declare. Nothing to declare, Kavina. Thank you very much. The first item on our agenda is an evidence session with officials from National Records of Scotland on the preparations for the draft census order. And from NRS, we are joined by Amy Wilson, the Director of Statistical Services, Scott McEwen, Head of Policy, Legislation and Engagement, Jill Morton, uh, Senior Business Lead, Questions and Collection Instruments, and they are accompanied by Scott Matheson, the Senior Principal Legal Officer for the Scottish Government. And I'd like to invite Amy Wilson to make a short opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, convener. We are very happy to be here today to discuss Scotland's 2021 census, to support the committee's consideration of the draft census order and the accompanying documents. National Records of Scotland has already been working over several years to develop a high quality census, the next of which is planned for the Sunday 21st March 2021. It will be the first one to be predominantly online and will meet the aspirations of society in 21st century Scotland. It will hopefully make the census more user-friendly and provide choice. The census is the only official count of every person and household in the country at the same time. It tells us who we are, how we live and how we work in Scotland and essentially reflects the society in which we live. And Scotland has relied on the information on the census for over 200 years and it remains the best way to gather much of the information required by government, councils, the National Health Service and other users. National Records of Scotland's core purpose is to collect, preserve and to produce information about Scotland's people in history. And we are very proud of the achievements through the census, the first one in 1801, and indeed through all the other statistics that we produce. And we wish this to continue for 2021 and beyond. This includes ensuring privacy is protected, along with census records being held securely and confidentially. Census outputs are essential to support decision making from national to local level, including allocating funding for schools, education, hospitals and infrastructure. Having accurate and reliable data is at the heart of the census. Billions of pounds of public funds are allocated in some way through the state so it must be credible and people must have confidence in it to take decisions. As you're aware, the approach we're taking with the census order follows on from the parliamentary committee recommendations from the 2021 census, where the committee asked the Scottish Government to simplify the procedure for future censuses. That is why we're starting the engagement early with committee for the census with the aim of dealing with all the matters before the formal process begins. Whilst this current process may be considered the informal stage, please be assured it's very much official engagement with yourselves. My letter of 5th September provided you with the draft census order and accompanying documents for discussion today and for your consideration over the coming weeks. The draft order reflects the approach we're proposing for the census in 2021 and the accompanying documents provide more information to support that, including the proposed guidance for respondents when completing the questionnaire. Planning for the census is progressing well and our rehearsal is only one month away. There are some matters still being finalised, which will be highlighted through our discussion today, and the rehearsal itself will provide some excellent feedback for our readiness and the approach being taken. Testing on many fronts is still ongoing, including the sixth question guidance, and I provided an update on that with my letter. This is all being done to ensure that we deliver the best possible census to Scotland's households in 2021, which in turn provides the best possible data for our country. By asking the questions which reflect Scotland as it is today, we'll ensure that the census will continue to be a vital source of information for decades to come. So I'd like to end by reassuring the committee today that National Records of Scotland will work closely with you to deliver the legislation that will allow the census we all wish to see for Scotland in 2021. The recent census bill demonstrated the interest in census matters and I thank you for your support through the process. I'm in no doubt this will continue through the census order process and we look forward to working constructively with you to deliver Scotland's 22nd national census. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Amy, for that comprehensive introduction. Um, and 
can I say, obviously, this uh, committee's engagement on the census has uh, been shaped by our consideration of the, the bill, and we have had a lot of correspondence over the last few days, principally around uh, similar issues uh, with regard to the sex question, and that's what my uh, questions are going to be about initially. Um, there's just a few things I wanted to, to ask you about, and you can just give yes or no answers um, if you want. Obviously, the, the Parliament unanimously agreed to include a voluntary transgender status and history question for the first time on the census, and this committee unanimously agreed that. And I see it appears uh, in our uh, draft questions paper, and I should put on record that I, I'm very happy with that too. Um, when you had originally con considered the census topic consultation back in 2016, um, there was you weren't proposing a transgender question. That actually came to you via stakeholders. And now here we have one on the census uh, for the first time. So would you say that that's a substantial win for the organisations that were campaigning for a transgender question? Uh, yes or no is fine. <laughs> Um, I, th I think it reflects the fact that there's a, uh, a need for data. So for data users, I think it is a substantial win for them. They will get the, um, the data that they need. And I understand um, uh, from the Office of National T Statistics uh, 2021 census topic research update in December 2018, they state that uh, regarding the gender identity topic, this is a developing area of research in many countries and currently no European country collects gender identity data in their census. Uh, that, that suggests that, you know, we are really ahead of the curve by having this transgender identity question. Yes, I think we, we are. We are, yeah. Um, so, so do you think that, therefore, any, any suggestion that somehow the census is rolling back LGBT rights um, is a bit unfair, given that we have a transgender question for the first time and we're actually ahead of the curve in this in terms of Europe? I think certainly in terms of the transgender question, I think that's a very positive um, step forward and equally with the um, proposed question on sexual orientation. Um, I think there are obviously concerns um, still from, from both sides around the, the sex question and how that is asked. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, sex, as you say, um, is a key demographic variable which has been asked since 1801 uh, and in your own sex and gender uh, topic um, paper, you say there's a well-established user need for sex data. It's a vital input to population, household and other demographic, demographic statistics which are used by central and local government to inform resource allocation and carry out service planning and delivery. Um, however, you propose to continue uh, with online guidance uh, for the sex question, which advises people to answer the sex question according to how they feel, uh, not the sex that's recorded on their birth certificate. Uh, and you, you specifically say that they don't need a gender recognition certificate uh, to answer the question uh, different from their, their birth sex. Um, obviously, that's something that we discussed um, during, during the bill's uh, passage. Uh, of course, that guidance that you introduced in 2011 um, was only introduced uh, online uh, and people weren't directed to the guidance. It was quite, quite difficult to find. Um, now, of course, we have a transgender question. So there is a question mark as to whether this guidance is needed at all. Um, you've been aware that a number of leading statisticians and data users uh, say that a self-identified sex question will damage data. Um, we took evidence from Professor Susan McVie from Edinburgh University the last time, uh, who believed that was a mistake. But as of yesterday, uh, we have received a letter uh, from Professor Nick Bailey of the University of Glasgow and signed by seven other social science researchers. Um, there's Professor Joe Ferry, Professor Susan Fitzpatrick, Professor Christina Ainelli, Professor Sarah Johnson and Professor Morag Trainer and Beth Watts at Harriet Watt. And their letter makes it clear that they support the transgender question, uh, believe it will be very useful, but they believe a self-identified sex question uh, will inhibit, inhibit, in their view to quote them, our ability to monitor sex-based discrimination and disadvantage. So how would you respond to the concerns of these 
eminent, eminent academics and do you intend to engage with them? Um, that is the first time, so thank you for bringing that to our attention. That's the first time they haven't, we haven't been in touch with them and they haven't been in touch with us. So the answer to that question is yes, we will engage with, with them, absolutely. What I would say about 2011 is that the data, there have been suggestions obviously that what um, was done in 2011 damaged the quality of the data. We went through an extensive quality assurance process which did involve quite a lot of academics and people working um, in local areas, other expert statisticians, and there was no evidence at that point that there was anything which we saw in the data which would suggest that we'd introduced something different from what had happened in, in previous censuses. However, it obviously is a concern for people, so we will continue to engage. And I think what we have recognised um, this time round is that the effect of using the guidance and providing the guidance, we don't understand enough about what that does, which is why we're doing the testing that we're doing at the moment to understand actually how much does um, either not looking at the guidance or having different versions of the guidance affect the way that people actually respond to this question. And I think it's really only when we have the information from that that we will fully understand whether we get anything different from using different versions of the guidance. The other thing I would probably say, though, is that the, the supposition in that is that discrimination only happens on um, a biological um, ground, and I don't think that necessarily is what many of our users will come back to and say to us in terms of what they're trying to measure in terms of discrimination, because it can be on the basis of perception as well. So I think what we are trying to do through the census question is meet a broad range of user needs, some of which may be actually more akin to um, someone's biology, but some of which much, might be much more to do with perceptions and how um, people are seen by others. Right, well obviously you're going into an area that we could have a a whole separate committee meeting about, you know, like um, many people would argue that women uh, are discriminated against their, because of their biology, um, you know, uh, but that is a whole uh, separate uh, area. Um, if I could um, go back to your point about the 2011 guidance, um, it was online guidance. My understanding is that only about 20% of people answered the 2011 census online, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And that online guidance, it wasn't necessarily flagged up. It wasn't beside the question. You have to, you had to seek it out. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. So it's fair to say that very few people would really have been aware of this online guidance. In fact, uh, it's been drawn out to our attention that Stonewall's submission uh, to your census topic and uh, consultation in 2016, uh, they, their submission suggested that they were unaware of the online guidance because they say that the sex sex and gender are different things and people wouldn't know how to answer the sex question so well the main lgbt charity didn't seem aware of it and when you engage with stakeholders um for this census your feedback from stakeholders uh lgbt stakeholders or trans people rather um they many of them didn't seem aware that they could answer the sex question in this way so it seems to me that from even from your own material, not many people were aware of this guidance, so it wouldn't have affected the data in 2011. I think that is a fair point, and I don't think we know how it affected the data in 2011. Um, what I certainly would say is, I say, from looking at the data and the quality assurance we've done, there was no evidence to suggest that actually we started to see different trends from um, anything that had happened in the past. But I think you're right, we don't know how it affected and how many people actually looked at the, the guidance in 2011. Yeah. And you're now, yeah, so, so it, w it, was, it, it wasn't going to be, it was going to be a very different issue from now, where it's now much more high profile. Society has changed quite, quite considerably, uh, and I believe that's why these uh, social scientists are so concerned uh, about, uh, about changes to the guidance. Uh, just finally, you talked about the testing. I know that other members are going to ask about the, the testing of, of the guidance, um, which I understand is, is, un, is, is ongoing. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that the plan is that you will uh, recruit 5,000 people randomly, um, but you will find members of the trans community through uh, trans organisations to test this guidance? Um, yes, that's correct. I mean, I'm, I think it's actually more than 5,000. I'm just going to ask um, Jill, my colleague Jill, if that's all right to, to answer, because she knows the, the details of it. Uh, yes, with the methodology agreed, and you're right, when we had the stakeholder events around the testing, our sort of figure was around 5,000. 
at 6,500 households were targeting for the general population. Um, and we are advertising through a broad variety of um, organisations that, that might touch on the trans community. Um, so it's not necessarily just... Uh, so you, will, you will recruit the trans respondents through organisations. Uh, now, you, you're aware through this committee is very aware that these organisations uh, have very, very strong views um, about this subject. So you're recruiting people for a testing exercise through organisations that have very, very strong views about the questions already. Don't you think that that's liable to da damage the way you collect the data and the, the outcomes of so the testing? we are partly recruiting through them but we are we're being very open to the way they're recruiting so for example we've been in touch with the nhs we're looking at whether gender clinics can actually help as well and we've been very open to all stakeholders to say that we would be um keen for anyone who wishes to be involved in the testing because you're absolutely right we want to have as broad a range of people from the trans community and to hear those broad range of voices as possible so although working with the stakeholder groups is um probably um has been the um, probably biggest way, or uh, but I think we're working with other um, ways as well, and we wish to, as I say, we absolutely wish to make sure we can hear a broad range of voices. Okay, thank you very much. I'll pass on to Claire Baker now. Thank you. Um, thank you, convener. Um, good morning. I wanted to ask some questions about the proposed guidance that you're just discussed. You're, you're consulting on. There's two versions of the guidance at the moment. Um, the the key issue for me is around the claim that there's, not the claim, but the, the proposal, there's interaction between the sex question and the voluntary trans questions. Um, and I'm not clear how those work. The, for example, the, the guidance which seems closest to the 2011 guidance says, if you, how do I answer this question? If you're a transgender, the answer you give can be different from what's on your birth certificate. So I just have a question about how that would then... So if someone's trying... It's in it can be, so it's still the choice of the person. So it would be difficult... I can't see how... If, when, if they decide to answer the voluntary trans question, how that might give you enough evidence on the answer to the sex question, that they, they interact, so that you could work out... If the users of the data wanted to work it out, they could work out... I'm just not sure the questions interact... Well, how they'll be consistent in the way they interact, because it seems that there's quite a lot of choice and flexibility involved in the interaction. The interaction there is specifically around how respondents approach and understand what the questions are asking, so that's something we've tested quite a lot. Um, so what we did find in, in across all of the testing we've done on this is different people approach the sex question with different understandings for the majority of the population. They don't distinguish between uh, any of the sort of... Um, definitions, for want of a better word, of the sex question that we've been looking at for census development. What well, we did find that when we had a sex question and then a trans status question, the trans status or history question directly after, after that, for um, some in the community, seeing that that question was there sort of can change how they might approach the sex question. So it's, and the, again, the similarly with the sexual orientation question, knowing that's there and being able to see that that's there uh, changes the way people approach this across the set of those three questions. So it's not, that's about how people are going to answer the question rather than an interaction for data users. So there'll be, so, the, so for people who are using, so it's not for data users, because it would be it would be difficult to then, if it's the person's choice, you've because you, you're not really directing them to say this is what you're meant to do. It's saying it could be different. It's up to you. Um, I just, just don't see how that helps collect accurate data, or what how you can how data users what information they can take from that. Apart from we don't really know how this person's answering, but. But maybe I think you're going to do tests. We can, we can. I think next week you're going to provide opportunity for us to see how the form operates. That might help my understanding of that. The other area around the two choices was around the advice you give to people who identify as non-binary, and there's two. They can either it says if you're non-binary and not sure how to answer, you could use the sex registered on your official documents, such as your passport or driver's license, and then says there's a question about trans. Another one says. Um, 
it just says you can... Yeah, it doesn't give as much detail. I don't know why you've chosen two different options for the advice, for the guidance, if you're non-binary. Why is that different in the two? If I understand your question, are you um, is it about on the one which is suggesting to people that they need, that they should respond with the birth, um, their sex is registered in their birth certificate? Why we haven't made some comment about non-binary there? Yeah, and then you've got two options. One was says mm. if you're non-binary and not sure how to answer the sex question, you could use the sex registered on your official documents, such as your passport, or your driver's license. Then the next question about trans status and history, and then the alternative proposed guidance has been tested just says the next question is a question about trans status and history. You could respond as non-binary in this question. So there's no advice, it looks like, in the second choice, there's no advice given to non-binary people how they should answer the sex question. I just wonder why why that is. Because I think the, the advice or the um, guidance in that second version is that they should answer with the birth as recorded in their birth certificate, which would mean that they couldn't be non-binary, so they would either have to respond as male or female, and that that should be as on their birth certificate, or if they have a gender recognition certificate, what that is. So we worked in these questions and um, the guidance with stakeholders from both women's groups and also from equality um, groups to make sure that actually what we were then going to be testing would make sense to people, and that was very much as well came back from the stakeholders about there was no need to provide any information for non-binary people in that guidance because it would not be applicable. Right, okay, so the suggestion is the first set of, the first guidance that is suggesting to non-binary people, you can answer it as you have, um, as you have identified yourself on a passport or driver's licence. And the second one, although it doesn't say it, is expecting people to register as what's on their birth certificate. But it doesn't say it. But if you're, it doesn't say that's what you do. It just says you can respond, doesn't tell a non-binary person what to do in the setting suggested guidance. So I suppose rather than trying to explain that to me today, you are testing these, and when will that be? When will we get further information on how the testing works the, and what? Jill, time and, to and added to that, can I just ask? Because you've said to the convener you're, you're doing the testing of the guidance. What um, what's the what's the weight that's put on the testing you do? Is it just that this is the proposal that gets the most responses, so this is the one we're using, or is there other factors that influence the decision? on which set of guidance you'll use? I think it's a complex issue, so it's certainly not going to be a straightforward thing. This is the one that gets the most. I mean, what we need to understand fundamentally is do people answer differently? So we're testing several things within this um, set of testing. We're first of all going to be asking people to answer the question without having any guidance at all. And then um, it's a split sample, so half of the population get one set of guidance and half of them get the, the other set. And what we want to understand as well is how do people answer when there's no guidance? How do they answer them when they get whichever set of guidance they're given. Um, and then we're asking questions around how acceptable it is. We're asking questions about when they read the guidance, would it change their response? So I think to pick up some of those issues about actually we, don't, we didn't understand in 2011 how the guidance affected how people responded. Um, and I think all of these things will need to be looked at to actually understand, um, is it acceptable to people? Does it change? Um, and depending on which version of the guidance you've got, what is it you're actually measuring? So um, I'll let Jill answer about the time skills, but yes, I mean, these are all the things we're going to be looking at and we will bring back to yourselves to, uh, in a report so that you can understand what it is that we found in that. Um, in terms of delivery of the, or completion of the testing, we're looking at a date towards uh, mid to the end of December. Um, there will be, obviously, these things don't necessarily go according to plan, so um, there's a little, that's why the little bit of flexibility, uh, but before the before Christmas. Um, I did have questions on other aspects, shall I leave those till we'll 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 other people? Uh, that yeah, that's once we've got thing. most of this topic out of the road. Annabelle. Hey, thank you. Good morning and thank you for coming in uh, and to continue our discussions on this important subject. Um, I, I just, uh, looking at this, sorry I'm a lawyer by trade, I can't help it, looking at this from an a priori perspective, Okay, so in the new, newest, the latest version of the proposed questions, you have question four. Okay, do you consider yourself to be trans or have a trans history? Okay, and then you go on to say explicitly, trans is a term used to describe people whose gender is not the same as the sex they were registered at birth. Okay, that's question four. Preceding that is question three, which is, what is your sex, female, male? So my question would be, how could you possibly have a, a definition of sex that is other than registered at birth 
in the interest of consistency, because at question four, your key point is sex registered at birth. So how could you issue guidance for question three, which isn't in accordance with the position at question four? I just don't get this. From a legal perspective, I simply don't understand this. This is not entirely a, a, a legal point, but um, convener, I'm not entirely sure that I under understand the premise of the, the member's question here. Uh, if the member is suggesting that the the guidance, the first option of the, oh, sorry, the second option of the the guidance, which talks about um, providing the the answer being the same as on the, the birth certificate, but then going on to talk about a gender recognition certificate. Now, a gender recognition certificate will have the effect of changing what is on one's birth certificate. So I'm not sure if the member is suggesting that the if legal effect of the Gender Recognition Act should be disregarded entirely. Well, obviously, uh, with respect, I'm not at all suggesting that. Uh, uh, um, what, and it is, uh, as you say, uh, the legal position that the gender red, red recognition certificate would supplant any prior document. That is well understood. That is the axiomatic legal position. Rather, my question is, how could you possibly issue guidance in accordance with the current language you have for question four that would suggest that sex could be defined as anything other than sex registered at birth? I just don't understand from a legal perspective how you can have such apparent lack of consistency between question three and question four. But with respect, I think the member has just has just said that sex registered at birth must be the only definition of sex that can be can be relevant. But it is the language of the NRS at the moment. So uh, it is understood that the gender recognition certificate, as a matter of law, uh, would supplant a previous document. But you are talking about sex registered at birth as being uh, the uh, key. Uh, element in with regard to question four in terms of how you define trans people so my question is very simple how therefore could uh, question three what is your sex have guidance that suggested other than sex registered birth and clearly the, the gender recognition certificate is a bit of a red herring because that is a legal position that is well understood uh, maybe the NRS would wish to reflect on that point further. I think it's a fundamental inconsistency as a matter of law. And I, and I think really, given that this is a, to be the gold standard of statistical data collection, I don't think that really could could obtain as a matter of law. It just doesn't really work for me. Help. You could maybe confirm that this is the case. Obviously, the effect of a gender recognition certificate is to change the birth certificate. So if you have a gender recognition certificate, you can change your birth certificate. That's completely different from what you're proposing with the sex question. You're proposing that people can answer the sex question even if they don't have a gender recognition certificate that changes their birth certificate. You're, you know, like that's, so there are two classes of people, if you like. There are people with gender recognition certificates that have changed their birth certificate, and there are also people who consider themselves transgender and you're saying answer the question how they like, but they don't have any legal documentation. I think that's the, the critical issue here. Yeah, sorry, but um, just, just for a second, come here. Surely in question three, it would just be easier if you just said, what was your sex registered at birth? Yeah. Surely that would just make it much simpler. Mm -hmm. And then you could lead on to question four. That is a question that we could ask, but I mean, I think we would need to understand that is likely to lead to quite different data from what we've asked in the past. Um, and again, um, it is asking a, a, a more specific question, I think, than the question which we are um, currently proposing, which is what is your sex? So if that were to be the case, then we would need to understand exactly what the effect of asking that question would be. And I think what we are um, reflecting is that from the data users' needs, yes, some data users would probably say that is what they needed, but other data users would not say that that is what they needed and it wouldn't meet their needs. And we're trying to meet a broad range of needs through the sex question. Can I just come back on the very important point about the actual underlying objective here? I think it's always important to go back to, to first principles and it's uh, to ensure that we have uh, data which is of a gold plate standard in terms of how we collect and, and methodology and so forth and consistency uh, is important as uh, well. Uh, so in that regard, it, it, it surely 
we go back to questions that we asked uh, actually considering the census bill i mean it's not about you know how a person feels about a particular question there may be lots of other questions in the census that lots of individuals find for whatever reason slightly intrusive or whatever it is a question of collecting data for the benefit of uh, the, the state in terms of all aspects of public life and public services provision and so forth so i would have thought then the key objective here is to ensure that for data users this is the best that we can do and that should be the key consideration other considerations can be considered but ultimately the key consideration should be the what is best for data users so that doesn't seem to be what you said in the, your your last answer your last well, statement a moment well, ago i'm sorry if that wasn't clear that is absolutely what i'm trying to say in my answer what i but I'm, what i'm trying to say is that i think there is no one set of uses which is made of this data and that for some people and it goes back to the point I, I, I made earlier for some people the data use may well be around something which is around um, biological um, data whereas for others um, or for legal um, sex for others it is much more likely to be a broader how other people perceive them and um, how discrimination occurs so um, there is not from the, all the work that we've done there is not one single use case in terms of what people need the data for so if you were to ask a question around sex registered at birth, it may meet some data users' needs. It would not meet some other data users' needs. And that is part of the issue that we have here. OK, that, that was an issue raised by, by Mr Gibbs. I mean, I, I, my key point remains that I think there's a legal inconsistency between question three and four. Last question, if I may, at this stage, uh, convener. Um, I just, I mean, it seems to me, and looking at the, all our uh, discourse on the, the census bill and where we are now with the pre-pre-draft of the census order, that a lot of this um, discussion could have been uh, um, streamlined, if you like, if there had been early engagement on the part of NRS with the statisticians. And I, I just really don't understand what the process has been such that we're getting, you know, this plea from statisticians uh, in an email of 11 September at 10 past two in the afternoon saying look you know from our perspective this is we've got serious concerns here i just don't understand how we've got frankly to this stage maybe you could help enlighten the committee we have been we have spent a lot of time um both uh, particularly over the last nine months consulting with people being extremely clear we send out we sent out um, updates to um thousands of people who subscribe to our newsletters discussing what we're doing so i think the answer um many of these statisticians will be linked into groups as well that we have been presenting at that we've been talking at so um yes we will absolutely follow up on this but this is not an engagement that has been um, brought to, they have not um, come to us in the past nor were we aware that there was any concerns despite as i say the fact that we have been trying to be as open as possible about um, what we're doing over the last um, nine months and indeed before that Okay, thank you. I mean, they would speak for themselves as to what they, their perception of this engagement has been. Thank you, Convener. What, what engagement have you had with Professor McVeigh? Um, Professor McVeigh, as you know, is a member of the, um, official, the Board for Official Statistics, as am I, and we have had some discussions around that we, um, we presented at the last Board for Official Statistics as well. Um, and she and I have had several conversations around her views on this. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Ross? Thank you, Convener. Um, just to, to pick up on, on the suggestion that was made a moment ago, if question number three was to ask um, what, is, uh, what, is your sex, or what was your sex registered uh, at, at birth, um, how, how would that interact with the protection that individuals with a gender recognition certificate have? Can, can you ask someone with a gender recognition certificate what was your sex registered at birth? I'm going to defer to my legal colleague. <laughs> I'm the member will no, no doubt be aware that there are uh, legal protections of confidentiality around uh, gender recognition certificates and, and their issues are, I would uh, take it that, that what, that's what the member's uh, getting at there. Um, what we're dealing with here though is some legislation. We will have the Census Act 1920, the order made under that, the regulations made under that. Those would be enactments and the Gender Recognition Act itself um, does acknowledge that there would be a, um, th there's an exception to the confidentiality provisions that are there is that if provision is made and uh, in an enactment so the the, the disclosure there um, that would be made uh, 
as the census form makes its way through the process, would all be being done in accordance with an enactment. So it would be within the uh, the exceptions to, I think it's section 22 of the uh, Gender Recognition Act. Um, that would be the, the legal position. More generally, there is a, a sort of a policy which is bound up in the existence of, there's a reason why those confidentiality provisions are there in the first place. And that's, that's part of the overall balancing exercise of um, a, Private, private rights of, uh, of privacy in the particular circumstances balanced against the public need for the, um, the, the outputs which are generated by the census. Thank you. Um, and there's been um, mention already in, in res response to the, the convener's original questions about the 2011 census and the guidance around that. Could you just clarify what the case was before the 2011 census in relation to the sex question? Before 2011, we never issued any guidance um, in previous censuses, and we have always asked a question which has had the response options male or female. It's been asked in a slightly different way um, um, ac across the, the years, but it's essentially the same question, which is, is a list of male or female with no guidance. Thanks. And uh, what's your best understanding of how people were answering the sex question before 2011? I, th I think um, we don't actually have an understanding because we've never tested at that point in time. We never had any guidance. Um, and I think we have said in the past, we it's almost de facto, it's been self-identification. I don't mean necessarily in that context that it's what um, has, what, how people would interpret that today, but it's a self-completion exercise. So we have, you know, we, we get back what people have said in the past um, is how they would interpret that question. The, the issue we have is we have no records, and we've looked back through this over since 1801, of any testing being done around that question to therefore understand how people interpreted that in the past. Thank you. Um, all of this leads me on, and, and by all of this I mean the, the last couple of months and the huge amount of correspondence that we've all received to, to ask the question. Um, is guidance on this question required? And what would the effect of going back to the pre-2011 position of not providing guidance be. And I, I say that from the understanding that um, I think it will be a challenge for the, the Parliament to come to a unanimous view on this if, if we were to choose a definition for guidance. And I, I believe this is a, a question that's been raised with yourselves by those, if I was to reduce this to a binary, ironically enough, um, by those on both sides of the debate, the question has been raised with you, is, is guidance required? I think what we will get back from this testing is an understanding of actually how do people respond without guidance and whether that changes and whether they can respond to the question. I think it was raised um, indeed by Professor McVie, uh, I, I, if I recall correctly, during evidence sessions about if we don't have guidance, then we don't understand what it is we're actually accurately measuring. And I suppose that would be the concern, given everything that's been said, is by not having guidance, do we have any understanding of what we're measuring? But equally, I think what we will, uh, the intention of the testing is to understand whether or not having guidance actually changes people's um, responses to the question and how it changes, depending on which version of the guidance you, you're using. Thanks. And, and just one last question, convener. Um, what's your understanding of how um, other census models in the English-speaking world approach this question? There's various... Um, they're, they're all doing different things, frankly. So some of the census offices are looking at kind of non-binary responses. Some of them are looking at asking a question around um, sex at birth and then how you currently identify. But for example, across the rest of the UK, I mean, in England, um, the ONS published guidance yesterday, which says that they will continue with what they have done in the past in 2020, for 2021. They will have a binary question um, and they have said that people, if they are trans, if they're non-binary, then they, um, they do not need to um, answer with the sex that's on their birth certificate. I presume the ONS have, have tested and come to that conclusion on the basis of that. Do, do you take the work they do into account, given Scotland and England would be the most broadly comparable systems? Absolutely. We, we work very closely with our colleagues uh, at ONS, and we've drawn strength from some of their testing and vice versa. And I think, actually, it's also been pointed out by a lot of our users, and indeed by the Office for Statistics Regulation, that harmonisation across the UK is also vital on such a key demographic variable. Thank you. Thanks, Convener. Been answered already, and apologies if I'm asking something that has been answered. Uh, are, is the NRS testing also in uh, for a no guidance scenario? 
It's not specifically for a no guidance scenario, but the first part of the testing that we are doing is actually as, um, asking people to answer the question without any guidance. So we will see how they answer without any guidance. And then some of the follow up questions within the testing asks them whether the guidance changed the answer to the question and asks around acceptability. Do, oh, Stuart McMillan, I've got a supplementary from Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, Convener. Just uh, on this uh, particular area, and regarding the uh, other countries uh, that, uh, that you talk to and, uh, and look at, um, have you been in dialogue with the uh, likes of Australia, New Zealand and Canada, uh, likes of the questions that they, uh, in this area, that they have actually posed in the past? Uh, we absolutely are, and in fact, colleagues of mine were across at the International Census Forum, which was held in um, Ireland last week, with um, colleagues from those countries, and it was one of the big things that was discussed. Um, and um, it, if um, you would like, we could write to the committee and provide um, our best understanding of what they're going to be doing at this point in time. Jill was um, there, so I don't know if you would like to say any more about what, what was discussed last week. Um there was a lot of discussion around this because I think uh, it's fair enough to say that internationally um, there's, there's no clear one answer or one question that works for every country and we are all working within our own political and social contexts and those actually help form the questions that can and can't be included. Um, so yeah, we will be actually sharing our testing results with the International Census Forum as well when we've got this testing completed because that's been picked up as an area internationally where there's a bit of an evidence gap to understand um, if you change the guidance, how does that change how people may answer the question or not, um, all those sorts of things. So, there's, yes. I mean, there has been a suggestion that uh, in terms of some of the other countries, uh, the introduction of a, a legal sex or a biological <coughs> sex question uh, in Scotland would actually go against the, the international uh, practice. And that therefore, if Scotland were to, to do that, then uh, that uh, would be uh, somewhat different as compared to elsewhere. I think in this one, there isn't, as I, as I sort of mentioned in the previous response, in the international census community, there's not sort of one question that suits all of the countries. We each have slightly different needs and we are all, you know, we work to our data users in Scotland with the very clear awareness that we have a UK responsibility and we need to be aligned. Other countries also have to meet their data, u need, data users' needs. Um, and certainly on this, I know ONS and ourselves have spent a lot of time talking to data users and, and so the trans data or history question, for example, um, has been developed for the Scottish context. The same applies to meeting our data user needs in Scotland as a primary purpose. Um, other countries need to do the same for their own context. Um, so while we work very closely together and we learn from each other, it's not as if we've got to a position where here's the one question that everybody should ask. Okay, thank you. Okay, Kenneth. Uh, sorry, just a very short question. Um, Convener, I'm struggling to understand why you would need guidance to ask uh, on um, a box that just said, what, were you, what was your um, sex registered at birth? Because it's either male or female. So why would you need guidance specifically on that question? You'd tick either one of those two boxes because you will either have been born male or female. I would agree if you were to ask that question, it's probably easier. I suppose that's the, the issue which we're testing at the moment. So that's not the question which we ask at the moment. The question we ask is, what is your sex? And don't define um, in the question what we mean by sex. And that is obviously why last time round guidance was introduced and we're testing guidance this time round. So I suppose it's around that interpretation of what is your sex. Clarification on, on that question to make it clearer, such as a question as to what you were registered at birth. Would that not be more helpful rather than trying to get through some kind of elaborate um, guidance where we're all, you know, seeing how many camels we can fit through the eye of a needle or dancing ahead of a pin or whatever the, the, the saying is? I mean, it seems to me we're making something which is relatively straightforward incredibly complex. As I said in a previous answer, I think that um, 
if we were to ask that question, it would meet some data users' needs, but it certainly wouldn't meet all data user needs, and there would be some data users who would feel that that definitely didn't meet their needs. So um, I think that is something that, that can be considered, but it is a different question from the one that we have asked over the last two um, the last 220 years, and therefore would have, um, I suspect, we would need to understand the effect that that would have in terms of long-term time series and indeed comparability across the UK. Well, from, well, from, um, from what you've said, it looks like no question is going to meet everybody's data needs. You seem to be saying, you know, it meets some people's but not others, so cl that would clearly apply to any question. And frankly, to suggest that, you know, it wasn't needed the last 200 years, I mean, I don't think in 1801 people really thought much about things like transgenderism or even in 1901 or 1951, I have to say growing up, it was never something that I that I came across my life at all until fairly in, in the last few years. So I think it's quite difficult to actually s s suggest that because it wasn't in the, you know, in, you know, in the, in the sense at the time of the Boer War, we shouldn't be asking it now. I mean, surely it's about trying to get the data that we need at this point in time in the clearest, most straightforward way possible. And surely simply asking someone, what was your sex uh, as registered at birth? You couldn't get more simpler and straightforward than that. Uh, um, <coughs> I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't ask the question because it hasn't been asked in the past. What I'm saying is that if we were to ask that question, it is a different question and we would need to understand what the effect of asking that question is because um, it is not necessarily the case that asking that question would give comparable data to um, the data which, for example, we got in 2011 or from the data that you get from asking a question, what is your sex? That, that's all I'm suggesting. Have we got any other questions on this area of the census? No. Can I just, sorry, can I just yes, just a couple of so the issue of guidance, how many other questions have got guidance attached to them? I think all of the questions have all got guidance and, I, um, and we've provided um, the, the draft guidance for all the questions to yourselves. So, that would be published online along with the census? Yes, it yes. will be, yeah. Uh, and is that a new thing? I'm just trying, because my understanding is that the guidance on the sex question is a new thing. It was introduced in 2011 for the first time. So actually, if you look at the period from 1801 to date, it's a statistical blip. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the oddity, if you like, not the norm, okay? So all this other guidance, was this published in 2011 online, even though at that time it wasn't an online... Uh, Yes, yes, it was. was published. Okay. Yes, and um, again, you know, we're trying to, to provide as much clarity for people. There is obviously, there's different levels of guidance which were there, and I, I hope when we can show you the online um, system, you see that there's, there's obviously, in some cases, guidance almost in the question, for example, the trans question, which, um, which you were talking about earlier, but um, then the people can go and get different levels of guidance. So if they just want a very... Um, quick kind of top line about what's this question asking about and then there's much more information that will be available if people wish to delve down into that. You talked also about a moment ago uh, uh, the, the, the uh, need for harmonisation across the UK. So is that therefore suggesting that every single question is identical to uh, what is happening uh, south of the border? No, absolutely not. And But we do equally, there is an agreement across the UK countries in terms of how we conduct our census to say we will strive for as much harmonisation as possible, but recognising that ultimately censuses need to deliver what the data users within the country actually need. But um, particularly with something like sex, harmonisation, obviously because it feeds into so many decisions, including funding decisions, these things are important. So it is one element that is considered. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. I've got a few more questions on this area before we move on to, um, uh, to the other members. I think it's best to do it now rather than at the end and come back to it. Um, just on this issue, if we continue to, as Annabelle suggested and as other people have suggested, 2011 guidance was something of a blip and not very many people knew about it even within the trans community. Um, if we went back to just asking uh, what is your sex without any guidance, um, as has been done since uh, 1801, um, the, the argument, the argu one of the arguments um, uh, that concerns people is the issue of confidentiality of how people answer the question. We don't know how people are going to answer the question and I just wondered if you could offer reassurance on the confidentiality of the census. I mean, for my, my understanding is it's a criminal offence to unlawfully 
disclose census data and a person may be fined up to £10,000 or sent to prison for disclosing. So it's, so it's, it's incredibly secure, isn't it? It's incredibly secure and we're yeah. working very, very hard to make sure that that is the case. Yes. Yeah, no. And um, so therefore that would reassure people that we really, nobody's going to challenge how you answer the sex question. You're always going to come back and say, oh, that's wrong because it's completely secure. That, that is absolutely the case. And nor do we check it against any other um, information to check for its veracity. Maybe, maybe that, that, that would, that would re reassure people on that particular point. Like no matter what conclusions we come to here, uh, the answers are secure. Um, I just wanted to go back to you know, the point that you made initially about, um, and I said we weren't going to discuss this in the committee, but um, you know, the, the issue of sex discrimination and, and uh, biological sex versus perceived sex. Now, um, the... The Equality Act has two protected characteristics, or several, nine protected characteristics, but sex is a protected characteristic and gender reassignment is a protected characteristic. So in the Equality Act, there is an understanding that these two things are different. And, you know, in the, the guidance notes for the Equality Act, it makes it very clear that gender, gender reassignment is a different thing from sex. Uh, I take it you're, you know, like you're very conversant with the Equality Act, are you? Yes. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it just seems to me that um, you're, you're slightly jumping ahead of the law here. I mean, we're having a debate across the UK about changes to the Gender Recognition Act and, uh, and whether we move to self-ID. Um, and you, by making the sex question the census one of self-ID, seem to be jumping ahead of that debate. Um, because you know, we haven't passed legislation either in Scotland or in the UK about this, and indeed the Scottish Government are reconsulting on it because it's a debate. So I just wondered why you're jumping ahead of that in the census to suggest that um, that the sex question is a matter of self-ID, not legal sex. I mean, I think most of the people who object to what you're doing are quite happy to compromise and say... We're happy to for people to answer on the basis of the legal sex if they've got a gender recognition certificate because those number of people are so small that it won't make any statistical difference. But you're jumping ahead of that and saying you can self-ID your sex. And that is that, that, that seems to me to be problematic. So I'm going to um, ask Scott if he can speak to this, but I think that where, where this comes to is the issue of what sex is as defined in the Census Act. Um, and I'm, I would ask if Scott has anything around the Equality Act and what we're actually asking. Yeah. I think the starting point would be that the Equality Act does its job and the Census Act does its job. Now, there's a connection there in that the data that is gathered in the, in the Census will feed in and be used by a number of different um, data users, and uh, Amy and colleagues will be able to say a bit more about that if necessary. Um, so there, there is a link there, but legislation has to be seen in the context of the job it's doing. The Equality Act gives rights and duties. It governs what behaviour is acceptable and how people should be treated. A fundamental principle running through it, obviously, is, is the, the dignity of, of the individual. The Equality Act will therefore get applied in the circumstances of particular cases. There will be individuals who are uh, legally of, of one sex, either because uh, they um, were registered in that sex and have not gone through a gender recognition uh, certificate application process and, and got a gender recognition certificate. Um, there will, will be people who are who ha have such a, a certificate um, and will therefore have the, the sex of their acquired gender, to use the, the, the language of the Gender Recognition Act. The, the interplay of the two protected characteristics that you have, have mentioned, that those of sex, taking the definition that it's given in the Equality Act, and the, uh, the protected characteristic of a... Uh, Gender, uh, gender reassignment. That's that's complicated, and that has to be looked at in the context of a particular case. The census is not going down and dealing with things at that micro level. It's not dealing with things where it is arbitrating between the rights and obligations of uh, of, of 
particular parties in particular circumstances. It's generating data for a wide range of, of needs. So in some ways it would it would be wrong or arguably it would be wrong to completely hitch the census uh, to the, the wagon of the uh, Equality Act um, because the definition in the Equality Act does its job there with all of the things which are there around about it. So it deals with direct and indirect discrimination. It deals with discrimination based on whether or not somebody actually has a protected characteristic or whether they are perceived as having that protected characteristic. All of those things are wrapped up there. The census has to do something entirely different. It has to collect data. It has to address a wide range of user needs. And so that is why I think it, at one level it might seem superficially attractive to just copy and paste the effect of the or the, the language of the Equality Act into the census. But then it wouldn't be doing the job that we're asking the census to do. Amy, I'm not suggesting for a minute that you do that. But what I'm suggesting is that, that um, Amy Wilson's comments at the beginning uh, did did attempt to define sex as something that was not biological, that it was a matter of self-identification. So you're saying we're not going to cut and paste the Equality Act into the census, but on the other hand, you are actually imposing uh, a particular view onto the census, um, which is that sex is something that people self can self-identify. And there's that's not anywhere in law, that doesn't exist in law. The the Equality Act does not define sex in terms of strictly biological. It it must admit of the possibility of somebody possessing a gender recognition certificate, and therefore, at a very minimum, it must a uh, it must be legal sex, which is dealt with there rather than strictly biological sex. Yes, so that that's, that's a point that will, like, has already been made to you, that people are willing to compromise on mm -hmm. that and accept that people can have illegal sex. But what you do is you go beyond the Equality Act, you go beyond the GRA and suggest that self is a matter of self, sex is a matter of self-identification. Back to what, what, what you're trying to get out of the census and the user data that yeah. which is being asked but, to be but the, the, the users who are, have got problems with this have, have pointed out that with subsections of the population not the general population, but certain subsections of the population as society changes. If you change the way you're defining sex, it will affect the data. And that's why we have these letters uh, from uh, data users and social scientists who say, in particular in the area of defining uh, sex-based discrimination, and the reason why sex is a protected characteristic in the Equality Act is, is, is because of the, is a recognition of sex-based discrimination. Yes, but I... I think I've tried to explain that the Equality Act definition sits in its own context and with the framework of the other things which are round about it. It's, um, it that doesn't give a perfect answer. You can't say that if you, if um, if the census generates uh, data output using, I mean, if, if we were to have something that absolutely guaranteed that people were to answer the sex question according to whether or not they did actually have... Um, or whether or not they were actually a man or a woman in the sense that the Equality Act 2010 would would have it, um, that that would necessarily tell you the most useful thing you, you need to know about those individuals when you are generating the, 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 the data for a range of user user needs. People are not... The, the data which are gathered are not being used to determine whether or not an individual is being treated less favourably because of the answer that they have ticked on, on the box. Letter from, you know, nine professors that would disagree with you, um, particularly on that point, le led by <laughs> Professor <laughs> Bailey. But I know that we've got a supplementary from Donald Cameron, so I'll bring him in now. Thank you, convener. J just to pursue this point of the conveners um, <laughs> on the Equalities Act, I, mean, I accept what you say, that the Census Act and the Equalities Act... Um, have different purposes. But the Equality Act is the seminal definitive piece of UK-wide equalities legislation and it combines everything together for the first time. It may be that the definitions within the Equality Act require to be revisited, but surely there is a strong argument, as the convener suggests, for there to be um, consistency between that legislation and the legislation that we're considering. 
at the very least. Oh, there, there may be, but I think that's a, wide, a much more wide-ranging um, policy question than I, than I can speak to. I mean, what the, the member might be suggesting is that when the Equality Act was passed in 2010, consequential amendment should have been made to the Census Act 1920. I'm not sure that that's, uh, that was in the mind of Parliament when it passed the, the Equality Act 2010. Should the um, should we not now, though, in, in our endeavours, whatever they may be, be the census or be the anything, not be required to operate in the context of the Equality Act? So the 1920 argument and amending that is a bit of a red herring. We actually have to, as legislators, operate within the strictures of the 2010 Equality Act in all our endeavours, irrespective of the area of activity. I think there's a, um, there would be a question in my, in my mind about in, in, in what way what has been proposed in the census order does not uh, does not fit with the Equality Act 20, 2010. Um, the, the Equality Act 2010 is not modified, nobody's rights and duties are changed as a result of what's being done in the census. Um, there's no suggestion that what's being done uh, relates to the reserve matter of the Equality Act or um, whether it would be out with the powers of uh, of this Parliament to um, to make the sort of provision which is being proposed in the in the census order, um, and I think as as Amy has indicated, there are there are a wide range of uh, data users who look to the census to get that data. It does not necessarily follow that what they need and therefore what should be generated to support a wide spectrum of um, of needs has to slavishly follow the, uh, the terminology or the meaning of the Equality Act. Quite a bold statement there. <laughs> yeah, it's quite bold because, I mean, like, the Equality Act runs right through all your documentation. You, you know, even when you're defining sex, you say sex is a protected characteristic in the Equality Act. You conduct an equality impact assessment because the Equality Act demands that of you. So the Equality Act is actually at the core of what you do. I'm sorry, if... Uh, if it maybe been unclear in, in suggesting that I, um, that it's not important and indeed um, you know, s central to, to 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 some aspects of of why the the sex data is is needed, but that's that's different from saying that um, there, there can only be one right answer to what must be asked in the in the sex question. It must be the answer. Um, of what is what is your sex as understood in the Equality Act 2010? Well, as I say, you know, you have said that you will engage with the the people who have written to you, the statisticians. I mean, that what they are they are the point that they make is that you know, like your census affects lots of other statistical exercises. It's the only source they say providing full coverage of the population on such a wide aspects of social life, and is therefore uniquely well placed to provide information on smaller population groups. And we, society is changing 10 years' time. You know, like, I think people could be identifying themselves in all sorts of ways. Um, and therefore, they're really concerned that, you know, like, that this will damage data. So um, you're under an obligation, understand, from the Statistics Authority to engage with statisticians. Um, and they could intervene if you don't. So I take it you will be... Yeah, you will be engaging with these people. And just my last point, uh, again, on engagement, is that you're supposed to have, you are having stakeholder engagement uh, with regards to the equality impact assessment, I believe. And you, it's next week, if th is that correct? That, that's correct, yes. Yeah. Now, my, uh, I've been approached by members of stake, stakeholder groups, um, not the professional, publicly funded stakeholder groups, but the independent ones that you've been engaging with. Um, they were given one week's notice of the date, and they were originally told that they could meet in Glasgow or Edinburgh, and now it's just Edinburgh. Uh, so many of them you know, feel that we're not going to be able to make it now because they've had such short notice of the date of the stakeholder engagement meeting. Is that something that you could look at if some people are unable to attend? Absolutely. Um, it's something we'd be very keen to, to look at because I think one of the things that we are very keen to do is to make sure we can get the feedback on the equality impact assessments and indeed the other assessments to make sure that they do represent um, the broad range of um, evidence that's out there and that we aren't 
um, missing, or that there's, there, there's not things in there which, which do not actually reflect people's experience. Thank you very much. Now we now move on to other aspects of the census, and I'm going to bring in Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Mina. You've talked about the, this census being the, primarily online, uh, and uh, you've also talked about the rehearsal uh, that you're planning to do. And I think you said it's in a month's time that that's going to take place. OK, can, can I ask about some information with reference to that rehearsal uh, as to how, how, how you're planning to progress that uh, and what safeguards may be put in place because you're using different types of technology and are you going to be trying to use all of that during the rehearsal? Uh, and if there are these safeguards, what risks have been looked at to mitigate any difficulties that you may arise from that whole process? So the rehearsal is due to take place with reference to the 13th of October. Um, it's going to take place in three local authorities um, across Scotland with 72,000 households. Um, and we've been going through a, a very long process of, of testing at the moment, making sure that we can test um, both for security issues, that we're testing for things like denial of service attack. We can test if systems go down and what we're going to do around that. So absolutely, I think what I would say is that security for us is, is um, very, very important. People are trusting us with their data and we have to keep that, that safe. We've also had an independent um, assessment done across all three census offices. We've published the results of that, um, which has um, shown us areas where we're generally good, but other areas where it's highlighted that we need to do more. Um, so we, are, we have been going through um, a lot of security tests at the moment to make sure that the information which we are collecting from people will be safe. And we've been publishing a lot of information, including the, the data protection impact assessment in advance of the rehearsal to um, give people reassurance about what we have done. And from guideline, guidelines that you've set out for these rehearsal uh, across the, the three authorities that you've chosen, uh, and, and they're feeding back into that process on a, a, a regular basis with you and at the end of this process and you've, when you've completed the rehearsal, uh, how is that going to then be managed to make sure that the information comes back and that everyone feels that it's gone securely? Because that's, as I say, that's the biggest concern uh, is that it, the majority of this is going to be online and there could well be uh, issues because it, it's difficult to make sure that every single aspect is, is covered and I appreciate you've, you've, done, you've done some of that, but at the same time it's the guidelines that are going to be put out and how you're going to manage that process. Yes, and I think I mean that that's one of the crucial reasons, I suppose, for doing the rehearsal is to make sure that on a smaller scale we can test this to make sure that we have all the processes in place and indeed the processes in place to deal with if there are any incidents and how we actually we deal with that. We will be doing a comprehensive report after the rehearsal, um, and we will be looking to um, which will be shared obviously well publicly, and um, because one of the things we want to be clear about is what we've learned from the rehearsal, what went, what hopefully goes well, but also indeed what are the things that. Um, will not go so well and um, we have a series of, um, of, of policies that we have to follow anyway if there are any information security breaches um, we will be making sure that we're following all the guidelines. And if anything does crash or there is a, a major issue in the whole process then, then how, how would you then revise that going forward? I think it, <laughs> I mean, I, we are obviously, if there's a major issue with something, we would want to make sure that that is rectified. Again, we would want, um, we would be identifying that in any report um, that was there, and then being very clear about what the steps are um, that we that we would be putting in place to make sure that that is then identified and indeed tested to provide the assurance before 2021. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mike uh, Rumbles. Please. Thank you, Camille, and good morning, panel. Um, I'm going to move on to the area of uh, ethnicity, and I understand the uh, questions in here. I'm going to refer to questions 22 and 23. On 22 is on national identity, and 23 is on ethnicity. And I would assume that you, you really want this to be as accurate as possible to get all the information that you need from it. And therefore, if something is to be accurate, it really needs a level of consistency. So. On question 23, when you ask the question, what is your ethnic group, uh, sub-question A is based on a colour. Uh, question C is based on geography. Question D is based on geography. Question E is based on geography and colour. And question F is, has religion in it. Um, is that consistent? 
the current ethnicity classification which we have, I think this is this is something that has been um, ongoing for some time around um, the issue, the fact that there's some colour terminology um, in there, and there's there's also um, geographic information. And I'll, I'll come back and address the point in religion um, in a minute. We have worked very. There was a lot of work done before 2011, which I think t um, took us to a certain point, and there has been subsequent work done with stakeholder groups um, since then. I think there are still um, stakeholders who, particularly around the use of the colour terminology black, um, who um, don't like the the use of that terminology, and we move, we'd obviously moved on in 2011 by separating out the African category. Um, we did consult around whether or not we should re remove the term black from the um, from the census this time round. Um, and I'll actually I'll ask Jill to to give some response to that because it was something that we last time round we actually had a very low response in that. So it was, and um, we wanted to know whether or not by removing that category. Um, what that would actually do, both in terms of how people were able to respond and also consistency over time. Um, but, I mean, I, I would accept the fact that actually this this does have different concepts in it. For 2011, we did try to um, look at an ethnicity framework which was entirely geographic-based. That didn't work very well um, either. So this is, I suppose, an ongoing process with stakeholders around trying to actually both get information which um, allows people to um, to address the policies that they want to be able to address, allows people to be able to actually respond, but also maintain some consistency over time. Because one of the things as well that we've got back from a lot of stakeholders is, given that this is such a key variable, if we completely change it, then it's very difficult to see how the situation is changing between 2011 and 2021. Mm, I understand that. Um, in terms of the consultation on the, the use of the terminology black, there is, uh, we've talked to a, a small number of groups because there's a, well, certainly from 2011, a, a small community that identified that way. Um, we had some um, evidence that we should keep the terminology consistent with 2011. Um, other stakeholders had suggested that the terminology <coughs> would need changed. The stakeholders that were data users suggested that the terminology that was um, presented in 2011 for this question was what they would need going forward for the reasons of consistency. I think the, the sort of the bigger point in terms of the NRS consultation on this was we weren't presented from a data use point of view with a strong need to change the terminology, but we were presented from a data use point of view to, to retain what was done in 2011. It, it just seems to me that what you're saying is just there is that you want cons to be consistently inconsistent because the questions are based on geography or colour. Can I just give you an example of what I mean here? If you go back to question 22, that's a really easy question. Question 22 is about national identity. It says, what do you feel is your national identity? Take all that apply. And I'm going to spend as a lay person, I'm new to this, a lay person coming in here, and I'd take, well, I'd take Scottish and I'd take British because I feel both. Then I go to the next question, question 23, what is your ethnic group? Choose one section from A to F, then tick one box which best describes your ethnic group or background. And then in subsection, I've got white, Scottish, or other British. So what's the difference ethnically, been, in my case, between being... Scottish UK or British UK or English UK or Welsh UK? What's the difference ethnically? Um, in terms of the format of the question on this, it's um, we look at the Scottish government as one of our key stakeholders as a key user of the data. Scottish has separated out to meet certain needs. We haven't been presented with a, a strong need to separate out, for example, England, Northern Ireland or Wales in that question. Um, this is actually one of the most widely used questions in the census, the ethnic group question. So again, we've got a question which is derived in a way to meet a very broad range of user needs. So yes, I accept your point entirely that it, it's... I'd answer that question and I've just looked at it. I, I do not know how to answer that question. Simple as that. So if you're after accuracy, 
I don't think you're going to get it. I think with the ethnic root question, just one thing to add is that we we have done, there's been a lot of work done on, uh, on this question and the, the related concepts around national identity and religion comes into this, this area as well because they're all sort of slightly different facets of how, how we may identify as individuals. And I don't think there is, this, this question very much is um, quite complicated and it's quite a sensitive topic for a lot of people as well. Um, we've got to the question as it's presented in order to, to meet a number of data users' users needs and, and the testing we've done um, for those purposes meets those needs. I'll just finish making, making that point. I'm confused. It's complicated. It's, in my view, it's too complicated. It's asking a question on ethnicity which isn't actually ethnic. And when you do ask the question on ethnicity, you're confusing colour and geography and mixing it all in, uh, and from my perspective, and it's been put to me by other, other people, this is why I'm raising this issue, <coughs> is that it's not consistent, and if you want to get accurate information, you've got to ask the right question. Kenneth. Yes, it's on questions uh, 21 and uh, 23. In 21, um, in the religious question, you've got, uh, um, you know, none, Church of Scotland, Roman Catholic, other Christian, please write in below. And then you've got Muslim, please write in beno below. Should that not be clarified to, if you're going to have Muslim and you're going to please write in below, should it not be uh, write in which denomination of Islam? Because someone might just write Muslim in the box as well as ticket, unless it's specific about denomination, surely. Um, you know, Shia, Sunni, whatever. Um, certainly on, on the digital platform, um, yes, that is... The suggestion you've made is is how it's presented uh, on the what the version of the questions that have been supplied to committee uh, are derived from the the paper questionnaire where we have more limitations on space and and therefore on design. So I think next week uh, this demonstration of the, yeah, of the that's okay. I just for coffee. And, and the other question I was going to ask was, you know, you've got in twenty one you've got uh, in terms of religion you've got Jewish now. But I know it's under ethnicity. You've also got uh, other. Uh, you've got class Jewish people as an ethnic group. It seems. So if I was to convert to Judaism um, tomorrow, what which which uh, what would I tick in question twenty three? Would I tick, um, you know, Scottish or would I tick, um, you know, Jewish? What would I, what would I tick? Because uh, surely um, um, there's a kind of wee contradiction there. Because one best describes the ethnic group or background, but you might if you suddenly convert, you might feel fervently for that. Um, so wh why is Jewish in his ethnicity and also as a religion? So we've worked with stakeholders for quite a long time on this question. Both the Jewish and the Sikh community or um, certain parts of the Jewish and the Sikh community have very strong views um, about the fact that these are both religions and also ethnic backgrounds. Um, and so part of the... And, in both cases, but particularly with the Jewish community, um, I think they have a, a strong sense and some evidence, I think, from, from 2001, where we asked a question about religion of upbringing as well as current religion, that um, asking a question which is, which is uh, as in question 21, undercounts the whole Jewish population. So you get people who are not necessarily practising Jews, who but are ethnically Jewish and may therefore um, wish to have Jewish services at end of life or... Um, um, other s such things that you don't necessarily collect them through that question, question 21. So we worked um, both with the Jewish communities and with the Sikh communities who'd made similar points to see actually should we include C um, Sikh and Jewish um, in the ethnic group question as well as in the religion question. Um, and I think probably the answer to that is there are split views in some cases. So taking the Jewish community we worked and did um, some surveying work with the the Jewish population and some people were not keen at all in having Jewish as an ethnicity um, because of all sorts of different connotations some people were keen on it but actually when we tested so we looked at whether we had a separate tick box for Jewish and that didn't actually test very well and some people were very uncomfortable about having it as a separate tick box under ethnicity but with working with the Jewish groups what we found was that for those people who wished to identify ethnically as Jewish having it in as a prompt was the best way to actually indicate to them that it was acceptable that if they um, deemed their ethnicity to be Jewish, 
whether or not they ticked that within um, question 21, that that was acceptable to do so. Um, with the Sikh community, it was slightly different. Um, and in fact, actually, when we looked at both having a Sikh tick box or indeed having a Sikh um, prompt, it wasn't um, as, as acceptable. And we've worked with the communities there um, to agree broadly that we will not have anything about Sikh in the ethnic group question. Thanks for that. I mean no, Barbara Streisand's Jewish and the late Sammy Davis Jr. was Jewish, but I don't think any of them would be classed of the same as the same ethnicity. Does this mean we're going to find out in future the census going to Muslims going to be an ethnic group, or you know we're going to move? Are we going to end up kind of merging question twenty three and twenty one eventually to an extent? I mean, surely if you take what you know, it just seems to me a rather uh, again a kind of inconsistency that that some religions are classed as ethnic and some aren't. I think, many religions have a strong ethnic base, clearly. I think particularly for those, and th those are the two groups, both who have um, approached us around this, um, but also my understanding is um, there have been some legal cases as well where it has been determined that actually these are, um, both of these religions actually are ethnicities as well as the fact that they are religions. Um, the other groups have not, um, and we've we've met with all of them and, and discussed this, but that's not been an issue for, for other groups, but it's very much coming from the, the groups themselves that they, for, for some people, not all of them, they deem this to be their ethnicity, um, in many cases, as well as their religion, but for some people, they don't deem it to be their religion, but they do deem it to be their ethnic background. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Kabir. Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Kabir. Um, I, should say, I, I represent around three quarters of, of Scotland's Jewish community and, and their representative groups have engaged with me quite a lot on this. Uh, and just to be clear, there are essentially three broad definitions of what it means to be Jewish. There is a religious identity, there's a cultural identity, and there is a recognised ethnicity. And you can be ethnically Jewish without being a practising uh, religious Jew, for example. That's different to other faiths. I, I'm a Christian, I'm a member of the Church of Scotland, that's clearly not an ethnicity, that is purely uh, a religious question. I can answer that in question 21. I can identify uh, as white Scottish in, in question 23. So the, the Jewish Leadership Council are, are very happy with where we've come to uh, in this census that uh, Jewish is included correctly as a faith, but in question 23 there is that prompt for people who are ethnically Jewish to, uh, to identify as such in the census because we know that one of the ways that anti-Semitism manifests itself is in discrimination against people who appear to be Jewish on the basis of their ethnicity. Regardless of whether or not they practice as a, a Jew by faith, they suffer from anti-Semitism simply because they look Jewish. So the, the Jewish community, on the whole, no position is ever going to be unanimous, on the whole the community are very happy with that and, and I'm grateful to you for that. But just to pick up what you said uh, around uh, the Sikh community, I'm not sure if you're aware, we've received correspondence from Sikhs in Scotland um, ar around this. Uh, Sikhs are similar in this regard in that um, Sikhism is, is a religion. There is also a legally recognised Sikh ethnic identity. Um, and the question I would therefore have is, um, given that we are quite rightly prompting under F for Jewish as an as an ethnic identity, uh, why not seek? Because I mean, you, you'll be aware for a variety of, of historical and cultural reasons um, that for many Sikhs who would be directed to tick a box for say, um, uh, particularly under C, it's, it's going to largely be under C for, for Asian. That's not something they're going to feel able to do because they, they don't recognise, they, they do not identify with that. Um, so including the, the prompt there for Sikhs, I think would it's certainly something that it appears there, there's an appetite for within the community. So if you could maybe expand a little bit on, on what you just said previously about your engagement with them up until now and, and how that corresponds with the, the correspondence that we've received. I'll ask Jill, who's been involved in. Uh, certainly. So the Sikh community had, had approached us um, during the sort of development process to, to ask us to consider whether they could have... Uh, a separate tick box in the ethnic group question as well as in the religion question and it was already in the religion question we had no sort of plans to to change that no reason to change that um, we spent quite some time sort of understanding data needs for you know who, who are the data users uh, in terms of data on the Sikh community um, and there is a there is an identifiable need for data we spent some time doing a, a range of testing with the Sikh community to understand that if we have Sikh in the religion question and, and an additional 
tick box in the ethnic group question, how did people respond to that? And actually, the, the results showed it was, a, as, it was pretty mixed. Um, whilst some members of the community were very keen and, and could identify um, as Sikh in both of those questions, others found it very confusing. Um, especially there was a difference by age, we noticed, in the testing we'd done. One of the consistent questions we got asked was why, if you're going to have Sikh in the ethnic group question, where are all the un other Indian religions? But I think essentially for us is we'd tested a variety or formats of the question of where, where might you include a, a Sikh tick box, um, because under Asian is not necessarily um, how everybody would identify uh, for 2021. What we did find on the various versions of the testing that we found that for the Sikh community, good quality data is collected on the Sikh population within the religion question, which is slightly different for, for when we tested for the Jewish community. Actually, the religion question only undercounted the size of the Jewish population. So Census 2021 can still continue to deliver good quality data on the, on the Sikh community within Scotland, However, that's through the, re the religion question rather than needing to be uh, identifiable in both questions or more than one question. I, I appreciate that. I think that, that's a useful answer. There's clearly a need for some further engagement with the, the community here, though. So I think it, it would be useful for, for yourselves to engage with the community and, and to keep the committee copied in on that. I, we, we, there's still something to be resolved here. Um, and just going back to the, the point that Kenny Gibson made around uh, Muslim, please write in below as an option for, for 21. This is something that I, I raised with yourselves at the um, private meeting that you had with the committee to get some informal feedback. Um, we talked about the fact that particularly for some older members of, of the Muslim community for whom English is not a, a first language, that's not clear. It's useful to know that in the online version that will not be the case. I'm still concerned that in this paper copy, and I understand absolutely that all being well, paper returns will be a small minority of census returns this time around. Um, but that's it's still not clear how a Muslim should answer that question. Other Christian, please write, please write in below. If someone is from another Christian group, I think that's broadly pretty clear what you're asking for there. My concern is still with Muslim, please write in below. Someone is not going to write Sunni, Shia, etc. They're going to write Muslim. Can I ask, would... If we were to consider, and obviously we, we, we can follow up more, but if we were to consider using the word denomination within this, would that be helpful, do you feel? I think it would, but I would definitely consult with okay. the community. I use denomination because that's the language I'm familiar with as a Christian who does ecumenical work. I wouldn't want to speak on behalf of the Muslim community. I assume that denomination is an appropriate word choice there, but it's something I would engage with the various Muslim communities on. I think just a small change, a bit more clarification in the language there in the paper copy will we'll sort this out. And I, the online version sounds absolutely fine. And we will certainly do that and follow up with them. Thank you. Thank you. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, can you tell me what uh, dialogue you've actually had with the uh, likes of Aaron Ebby Scotland, Visibility and other organisations who deal with sight loss? Um, that's definitely something that we've got planned for going forward. Um, sorry, can I ask a question back to you? Just to clarify so I understand what I'm asking, is this in relation to both digital and online, uh, yes. digital and paper forms or... Uh, it's both, both, both for digital and paper. Okay. Um, I'll start with the paper form first. Um, we've got a, um, we've got planned some accessibility testing for the for the paper form that hasn't been started yet, um, but we will be doing that. Um, in terms of the digital platform, there has been some accessibility testing already undertaken. Um, there was some positives came out of that. There's some things that we need to go away and consider. Um, so, so that's there. So yes, there is accessibility testing across both the platforms with um, people who face barriers completing forms. Um, so yeah. Does that also include the likes of uh, uh, Dyslexia Scotland? Um, we've engaged with a number of, of organisations and I might need to come back to you on this, I think. I think um, we'd be very happy to write to you and um, 
give you details of who we've engaged with. I know that some of the testing, it was, yes, we did um, testing around visual accessibility, but also around language use and making sure that things were clear. And again, we got some feedback back. But again, I think this is some of what we're, we will be looking to do through the rehearsal is also learn from that and understand to make sure that, that um, it's, it's open and accessible to all. Okay. Well, I chair the cross party group on visual impairment. And um, the deputy convener of the cross party group on dyslexia. Uh, so, hence the reason for, uh, for reasons. So, I, I certainly I'll look forward to your replies on this. Uh, in, terms, uh, in terms of the actual census, for how long will the census actually be live? I, I know, obviously, it's census day is the 21st uh, of March. But for how long will it be live? Certainly online. And, and what's the, the length of time that pe people will have to uh, fill out the census? So in 2021, it's slightly different for the rehearsal because it's a shorter period, but 2021, it will be um, about nine weeks. So the census, the 21st of March is the reference date for the census, but we will be contacting people um, about three weeks before and we will be... Um, accepting responses and indeed encouraging responses because one of the things we want to make sure is that we get people to respond as early as possible but also so that we can um, make sure that everybody's not necessarily responding at the same time the census will then remain open for six weeks afterwards and um, while we do follow-up activity as well we'll be doing further um, communications encouraging people to respond and then gradually as that we get into that six weeks as well as the the follow-up activity we do get into um, towards the end non-compliance activity for people who haven't complied with their legal obligation and um, then and then after six weeks we then start activity in the field for um, what's called the census coverage survey which is how we then go out and do a separate survey and estimate the size of the population that haven't actually completed the census so nine weeks in 2021. Okay. Is, that, um, is that something that was learned from the, what happened in Australia in 2016 uh, when, when the census failed? Absolutely, although they have a slightly different model. They have, uh, um, uh, they actually encourage people to fill their census in on the day of the, so we've always had a reference date in terms of, so it does help us balance things we will take, even in 2011, we encourage people to do beforehand, but I think particularly with going online um, in a major way this time, that is absolutely essential, is to be saying to people, you're filling in the information as it relates to the 21st of March, but it does not need to be done on the 21st of March. Okay. Uh, and my final question, just as in terms of 2021, um, there's going to be a, well, there'll be a lot of other things taking place uh, within uh, uh, within society, and certainly in this Parliament will be uh, being dissolved uh, to into a Scottish parliamentary election. Uh, notwithstanding what may or may not be happening regarding the uh, the Brexit and uh, the implications of that, uh, so what promotional activity will you be doing? What type of advertising campaign will you uh, have you uh, will you be undertaking to? Uh, to get the message over to people as to a that they need to fill it out but also how important this is but also not to forget uh, to actually take uh, take part in the census so we're working on that at the moment with um, the creative partners we're working with scottish government um, marketing and comms colleagues around that and part of what we're doing at the moment looking to 2021 is doing a lot of research with the uh, members of the public to understand how they um, see the census to understand what messages will resonate with them because ultimately what we want to do is to get people to complete early we would like as many people as possible if they're able to complete online and we want um, to people to complete without having to have somebody go around and follow up on them so it's around understanding the messages again making sure that the messages are clear about the value of the census and what the census is used for and that's work that's going to be going on it's already started and will be going on over the next um, year or so so that we get to the point of having an agreed campaign um, one of the, the reasons for choosing the date of the 21st of March, which is the earliest the census has ever been, was to make sure that we actually avoid the pre-election period for the Scottish Parliament, um, because I think it is really important, again, that we can get that national message out about complete your census um, before, understandably, there would be attention elsewhere. Um, so, again, we will be working, probably we will be going, I suppose, before the census starts into that kind of pre um, period of it's coming, raising awareness, making sure as well that we're working with community groups and others so that people, when they get um, their letter asking them to complete the census, that's not the first time that they've heard about it. Okay, I'm uh, sorry, and just one final question. Just regarding the, the, the technical element of this, uh, for the online element, now, obviously Alexander uh, should ask some questions about this earlier on, but uh, I take it you've undertaken some uh, financial estimates uh, for what additional um, IT infrastructure that you're going to require. Uh, also, because you want to have 20% uh, last time round filled out online, you're going to want to have that to be uh, vastly increased. 
So that's also going to come at a cost and, uh, and also the planning for that uh, will need to happen sooner rather than later, I would imagine. Absolutely, and indeed the system which we're using, I mean, much of that infrastructure is now already in place um, and will be what is being used in the census rehearsal. Um, and um, what we're, the, certainly the online collection tool, the Shrine um, this time, so will be cloud-based, it's cloud-hosted as well, but in a secure way so that actually we can respond to the demands of if thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are working and wanting to complete at the same time. That's been tested um, already leading up to the rehearsal, but again, we'll learn valuable lessons, I think, from the rehearsal around that. Okay, thank you. I have got a supplementary from Annabelle. Yes, thank you. Mira, just very briefly, um, picking up on the um, excellent uh, uh, innovation in this uh, census in 2021, uh, such that it will not uh, be solely the head of the household that completes the census, which is a really, I think, a welcome development, and everybody was very pleased to see that. Um, in your rehearsal, um, in whenever it is to come in the next weeks, um, how will you, because this is a new departure, how will you try to ensure that that actually you know, works? Because this that you're doing, so what arrangements will you try to make to ensure that there's a, a good take-up, so particularly with plus 16 euros? Yes, so I mean, last time around we did actually um, allow people to complete individually, both online and, um, but of course, um, particularly online, there wasn't such a, a big take-up. Again, we're being very clear about the fact that people can, if they wish, um, to request um, their own individual response. And again, through the messaging that we're putting out, this is about either you can do that with agreement of the person who's filling in the census form, so you can be saying to them, I want to fill in my own census form, and that's fine, they won't put you on the form, or also to ensure confidentiality for those people who wish to complete but don't wish to have to tell the person who's actually completing the main census form, I'm going to do that, then there are arrangements in place, and we'll be very clearly signposting all of that on the website in terms of how people do that. Okay, well, that's very good to hear. Uh, in terms of um, general awareness, would you intend to work with, for example, Young Scott, the Scottish Youth Parliament and so on, just so to ensure that young people know that they have this option? Um, we're working with a range of stakeholders for the rehearsal, but yes, I think that's an important thing that we must make sure that we pick up, and we definitely will be doing that leading up to the 2021. Um, but I think, yeah, one of the things we are keen to learn from the rehearsal is exactly what proportion of the population take up this option. Um, and both because it matters in terms of how we need to support them for 2021, but also eh, we need to know that from the point of view of volumes of processing. But um, yes, we will continue to engage with, with partners who can help us on this. Okay. I would have thought young carers would have an important uh, role there as well. Yeah, and actually that had been brought to our attention recently, so we'll make sure that we're actually doing work around that um, and making sure that actually, again, people are able to, to provide that information in a, a confidential way. Thank you. Claire? Um, thank you, convener. I have a couple of questions on other issues. Um, I suppose it would be fair to say from the discussion this morning that the census involves a combination of questions. Some are factual, so when it asks you what qualifications you have, you've either got five O grades or you don't. And other ones are based on self-identification or interpretation. So back to the ethnicity question, the guidance on ethnicity said it's up to you how you answer this question. So that's one that comes down to it's up to your interpretation. Um, so I was interested in the Scots question, which was introduced in 2011 on Scots language, which again says it is, um, the guidance, it's up to you how you answer it, and the guidance lists, um, there's lots of different words for Scots, it could be Borders, Doric, Fife, um, Shetland. I just wondered how, because again that's a self-identification question, so it's not trying to measure because people seem to be asking quite a few questions about accuracy. In some ways, it's not, mention, it's not measuring what is accurate. It's, it's measuring how people, what they feel their knowledge of Scots is and how they interpret Scots. So I wondered how, that was introduced in 2011, how that question worked the last time. I think, I mean, you're absolutely right. There are a range of questions in the census, some of which are probably much more factually based as opposed to um, p how people identify or um, the, the Scots question as you... As you mentioned, certainly for 2011, there was a lot of testing done around that question because in previous work which had been done looking at Scots language questions in the census suggested that actually it's quite difficult to get to some of that level of granularity with one question. Um, so I think it is fair to say that actually it is that broad um, identification question because, um, you know, actually people's understanding we found 
prior to 2011 is quite broad in terms of what's meant by Scots language, and therefore it is quite a broad question. I'm not sure, Jill, whether you, there's more you could say. Yeah, I think just to add, across um, the guidance that supports a range of the questions, and this, the Scots language one in particular, we are continuing to work with stakeholders to, to refine the guidance for 2021 to make sure that actually it is as far as we can make it gathering the data that meets that meets their needs. Um, so I think that's the only... But yeah, as Amy's acknowledged, some of these are... Because the census is a self-completion exercise, we are relying on everybody to answer in, in the best way and the honest way that they can. Another question was around the health question, so question 18, um, the less mental health condition. Yes. Other ones, so when I looked in the guidance, um, that includes addiction on the list. And I wondered if that had... Um, if you're confident that collects that information. I know it does have the other condition you can write in. It's just if it's, I don't know, it's just kind of stuck out to me, is that the, the right place for that condition to be? Or do people who are filling it in, do they recognise addiction as being a mental health condition? Are they going to, I don't know if you've done any testing on that or if it was used previously? Or? Uh, we haven't specifically tested whether people um, would recognise addiction as a mental health situation. Um, we. This is another of the question where the guidance, we're working with a range of um, organisations to, to try and refine, refine those lists to make sure that we have got things in the right place. Um, so uh, certainly that's one we can take back to consider. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Can I say thank you to all our witnesses for coming in today. That's the end of our session and we shall now move into private session. Thank you.